In Britain, we quite rightly take honesty and truthfulness very seriously. It's something we want all people to be, and we are expected to be ourselves, truthful and honest. Very often, we can criticise our MPs, especially, it seems to me, for being dishonest. But, you know, that is taken very seriously when MPs are found to be dishonest. I'm sure you know that in the House of Commons, it's considered unparliamentary to accuse another member of lying. In fact, if one MP accuses another one of lying, they are ejected from the chamber until they apologise. It's taken that seriously. That doesn't mean that in history people haven't tried to get round it. The uh, famous example, of course, I believe it was Winston Churchill who accused another member of being guilty of a terminological inexactitude, <laughs> trying to get round the rules. But honesty, truthfulness is of utmost importance. Our commandment today says, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbour. And of course, we often take this to be a, a command about lying and that we shouldn't lie. And of course, it is that. But it is a whole lot more than that, as I hope that we will see. Let's bow our heads to pray before we get into this uh, commandment today. Father, be with us today. Help us to hear your voice as we read your word together. We pray that you would uh, show us uh, what areas of our lives we need to change for you. In your name we pray. Amen. So this commandment is framed in the context of uh, a court of law bearing witness against a neighbour. The picture is that you have been uh, called to give a, an account of something that has happened to uh, uh, bring the truth to bear on an accusation that has been made. And you are to be truthful. Now, that's really important for us today, but way back when these commandments were first given, it was even more truthful. Today we can test people's um, arguments uh, and uh, 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 answers to questions with all kinds of forensic evidence. Uh, you know, we can get tiniest fibres or little bits of DNA or fingerprints or whatever you have, we, we have. There was none of that way back in Moses' day. And so the, uh, the word of witnesses was desperately, desperately important. Indeed, if you remember, as we'll see later on, it was the word of witnesses, false witnesses, that sent Jesus to the cross. So this is really important, and it has to do with how we relate to other people. So as we unpick this commandment, the first thing to say is this. It says that we need to be careful uh, of saying things of other people that are not true. We need to be very careful not to slander people. Not to say they've said things they haven't said or, or done things that they haven't done. That happens, to get back to the opening example, that happens so much in politics, doesn't it? And journalism, where they are uh, uh, journalists constantly, it seems to me, and politicians constantly seem to accuse one another of things. So that they're always on the defensive. We are not to be like that says this commandment, we are not to say things of other people that are not true. Now that means passing on gossip as well. If we hear something about somebody that we don't know whether it's true or not, it's wrong to pass it on if, if, if we can't verify its truthfulness. We shouldn't say things of others that are not true. 
nor should we exaggerate things about other people to make them something that's larger than life or becomes not true. We shouldn't say things of others that are not true. The second thing that this commandment includes is this, not saying things of others that are true. You know, there may be occasions when we uh, are involved in a conversation about somebody else or the subject of somebody else arises uh, and we have the information to justify what a person has done that seems to be uh, strange or wrong or bad. Or it might be the people are running somebody down and we ought to be able to say, well, that's not true. Not saying things of others that are true can be just as bad as saying things of others that are not true. It's like the sins of commission and the sins of omission. Both really important. And the third thing that this commandment has to do with is thinking the worst of others. How often do we do that? Whether it's a colleague in the office that we don't really get on with, whether it's somebody in the family or a friend that we've fallen out with. We think the worst of them. We moan and we grumble maybe to ourselves or worse, to other people. We run them down, putting the worst possible spin on something, rather than trying to think the best of people. You know, it's a good principle in life, always to try and think the best of people. If somebody does something you don't like, or you don't agree with, or something that perhaps upsets or offends you, try and think the best of them. Why did they say that? Why did they behave like that? We don't know each other's circumstances. We don't know each other's hearts. We mustn't think the worst of others. Rather, we must think the best of others. So why might we want to lie or bear false witness in the first place? Surely this is something that uh, ought to come naturally to tell the truth, isn't it? Well, I have to say that too often what comes naturally is not the truth, but the opposite. The problem is this. Very often we want others to think well of us. And if that means putting a spin on a situation to make it look like another person is not so good and makes you look better. We can be oh so ready to do that. When we are asked about another person, we can have the question in the back of our mind, what do I want to get out of this exchange? How can I spin this to make myself look better. It's a difficult one. It's something that every human being battles with. Because right from the Garden of Eden onwards, we want to run our own world, to run our own universe. We want to be masters of our own destiny. And that can so often mean trying to manipulate our situation and sometimes the truth is a casualty. So why lie? It's inbuilt within us to make ourselves seem better. But it's worth thinking about uh, this other question for a moment. Just take a step aside to ask the question, is it ever right to lie? Well, I want to suggest to you that sometimes it may be best. It can never be right, but it may be best. Think about Rahab and uh, hiding the spies in uh, Jericho. She uh, lied 
to the soldiers that came to the door to say, are you hiding the spies? She said, no, I'm not, when she blatantly was. And she was commended for her actions. Is lying wrong? Well, lying is always wrong. But sometimes, as in the case of Rahab, it was a better than the other outcome may have been. Think of Corrie ten Boom, hiding Jewish people in the Second World War from the Nazis, lying about their presence. Was that wrong? Well, lying is always wrong. But had she not lied, a greater evil would have come about. What makes uh, commands and rules that seem so simple, what makes them difficult is that we live in a fallen and broken world. And sometimes in our fallen and broken world, we may be faced with a choice between something that is wrong and something that is more wrong. Sometimes it may be the best thing to do to tell a lie, even though it's wrong. Now that's a difficult one for us to get our heads around and it's very uh, difficult to work out in which situation that is the case. In Rahab's situation, Corrie ten Boom's situation, it's very clear. But that's by no means normative. That's not the normal way we live and the normal questions we have to ask. It's just something that we need to address. So, this uh, document, the Ten Commandments, as we've seen, is the covenant document of God's people. This is the, the covenant uh, promise and the covenant requirements that God uh, makes of his people. Not to get them in, but because they are in. I'm sorry if you're fed up of me saying that, but it's so easy for us to misunderstand and to think that somehow in keeping these things we're earning favour with God. No, we already have the grace of God, as we'll see in a moment. This is our response to the grace of God. So how does God's covenant hymn book deal with this question of honesty? Well, I've uh, chosen today to have a look at Psalm 4. Uh, which is a, a wonderful little psalm. It's only uh, eight verses long. It says this. Answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You've given me relief when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. O men, how long shall my honour be turned into shame? How long will you love vain words? and seek after lies. See, these first two verses tell us two very important things. Verse 1 tells us that God is true. He is faithful, truthful, honest. If he were not, he could not be God. God is true. That's what verse 1 is about. Verse 2 says this, we are not. So God is true, truthful, honest, we are not. And then verse 3 tells us this, but know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself, the Lord hears when I call to him. God is true, we are not. So we need to put our hope in God. It's simple, isn't it? If God is true and righteous, and we know that we're not, there's no other suggestion of what we should do. Put our trust in God. And the rest of the psalm goes on to exhort those who believe in God to live in a godly way. To be anger, angry at things at which God is angry. Injustice and disobedience and strife and dishonesty. 
to consider the goodness of God, to worship God rightly and to throw ourselves on him. That's the exhortation in verses four and five. And then verses six to eight are a meditation on that. Have a look at those things uh, for yourselves. And um, I'm sure you'll see that they are true. Let me just give you this outline again for this song. Verse one, God is true. Verse true, two, people are not. Verse three, God is our, our hope. Our hope is in God. Verses four and five, exhortation to serve God. Verses six to eight, meditation. Just take this psalm again later on and have a look at those things again. Okay, so we know that truthfulness, honesty, is the way we should behave, the way we should live. We might say everybody knows that, whether they believe in God or not. But why is it so important for us as believers? Why is this part of God's covenant document? Why is this one of the ten? And the answer is, as with so many of these commandments, truthfulness is at the very heart of the nature of God himself. God is truth. Do you remember Jesus said, chapter uh, John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We read uh, elsewhere in the Old Testament, in Numbers chapter 23 and verse 19, that God cannot lie. And we read that time and again. God is true. Now, if we are to reflect the nature of God to a world that needs to know him, we too must be true truthful, honest. On the other hand, the Bible calls Satan the devil, the evil one, the father of lies, the exact antithesis of God. God is true. The fact that we are not means that, well, you know, we, we, we are in a pretty poor position. That's exactly why Jesus came. So many of the Ten Commandments are, are brought uh, to bear in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. Jesus was uh, tried in a kangaroo court by people that made things up about him, people that twisted his words. They were bearing false witness to Jesus. He didn't seek to justify himself. He took it. And he went to the cross. And he did that for me and for you. We are to be like Jesus. He has given everything for us. We should give everything for him. Do you know, as Christians, as believers, we ought to be known for our honesty, for our trustworthiness, for our reliability, for our thinking well of one another. Is that true of us? I hope it is. Is that true of you? I hope it is. Let's bow our heads to pray. God, our Father, we thank you now again for your word. Please help us. Help us to be honest and true as we live for you, that we might reflect your truth and your light and your glory. In your name we pray. Amen.